Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we start, can I please request you to put your headsets on? So the topic today is keeping your customers happy with personalized, accessible, and AI-driven experiences. And I have an expert with me to share his thoughts on this topic, Steve, the Chief Data Officer at the Very Group, and someone who has been at the forefront of data industry for the last many years. He has closely seen data shape not just our businesses, but our habits and lives in general. Uh, I am Aditya Kalia, Senior AVP of Data and Analytics at EXL. EXL, uh, you might not have heard, uh, some of you might not have heard about it. EXL is a leading data analytics and digital operations and solution services provider. And we help our clients embed data intelligence in their day-to-day -day operations and decisions. And we have been uh, partners of the very group for the last eight years. So, Steve, let me start by requesting you to tell us a little bit about yourself and the very group. Mine as well? Give someone a wave. Oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Good job I asked. Otherwise, uh, 25 minutes of chatting to each other. <laughs> um, yes, so, yeah, I'm Steve Pimlet. I'm Chief Data Officer of the Very Group. So the first thing I'm going to ask, which my Chief Marketing Officer will ask me, hands up if you know who Very are. Not bad, not bad, okay. So, um, so yeah, the Very Group uh, are actually over 100 years old. So it's one of the first catalog businesses in the UK. So um, anybody that's as old as me right, might remember the old Little Woods businesses and Little Woods catalogs, Index, back in the day, Ks. So yeah, I think it was 1896 when the first catalog was, was produced um, and Very was sort of founded way back then it was called shop direct so you know 100 years of digitization so we'll come on to that in a minute um my role there as chief data officer is to run all data analytics data science across the whole group so that's everything from you know helping understand customers and their digital interactions on the website you know we've got four million customers using apps um you know, desktop mobile each and every day to, to shop with us um, and I also look after you know, all the data analytics to do with supply chain. So we've got 2,000 brands, 250,000 products, um, a supply chain, a digital warehouse, a call center of 1,000 staff. So it's a relatively large operation and I, and I run data analytics for, that, for the whole group. Um, I think we're gonna double click today in, you know, in particular on e-commerce and, and digital experience. Um, but that's a bit of a framing. Maybe just a, a, a scale, a few facts on scale. So about two billion turnover. I mentioned um, you know, four million active customers. Um, we delivered 50 million parcels last year, so about a million parcels a day. Um, obviously through peak period, which we're coming to, that's a lot higher. Um, and um, we're also outside of the banks, um, one of the biggest lenders in the UK because a lot of customers like to pay by credit, you know, spread the cost over many months or years as well. So, you know, a, a real scale of business uh, and data AI and the customers right at the heart of it. Yeah, and what an incredible journey it has been for the very group. Catalog retailer a decade back and today a leading pure play digital retailer. So share some highlights from this transformational journey and what role did data and technology play in that? Sure, well, um, I, I won't claim all the glory for the last 100 years because <laughs> I've only been at Very for three years. Um, but, but definitely, um, I guess, it, embracing technology trends really early. So you, you, you could definitely argue, um, you know, Very, as a catalog business, went into the high street. Um, you'll remember Littlewood shops and index shops, etc. And there was a really brave call to actually close the shops and go pure digital. Why? Because they just believed that's where the future of retail would be, that's where the future of innovation would be, and that's where the customers were going to be. So, you know, to embrace digital trends has been a part of the heritage of, of the very group. Um, you know, and just adopting technology, leveraging it, and creating value and great experience for customers. So, yeah, early adoption 
throughout those hundred years and, and transforming on the back of technology has been a big part of it. Yeah, and I'm sure transformation of this scale brings in some hurdles and challenges as well. So what were the key ones that you faced and how you actually used those to drive innovation? Oof, I didn't know these questions were going to be this hard. <laughs> um, well, for me, barriers, it's never really the technology. It's not the AI, it's not the platform, you know, which search tool you build, build versus buy. It's, it's people, that's the, the biggest challenge. It's the cultural hurdle of, you know, um, the people change, the people element, adoption of whatever it may be, uh, you know, tangible examples. Um, we've got at the moment, you know, we'll talk about AI, but just one small use case. So we, we say we've got 250,000 products at any one stage from 2,000 brands. So that's an awful lot of copy to manage. You know, if you're gonna get that product description live on a website for the customers to interact with it, there's just a, you know, a massive process in comes Gen AI with the opportunity to create copy, you know, much easier. So we, we've done some really, you know, smart things with take a short description and an image and pre-generate a long description, which is copy. So the barrier is now not the tech, the barrier is the copywriters saying, well, that's my job. I add the human element to it. I add the flair to it. And actually re-educating them and retraining them to start doing prompt engineering. That's, that's the challenge. It's, of course, there's tech challenges and there's data challenges and there might be legal challenges, yeah. but the biggest hurdle in the adoption is you know, the human in the loop exactly. wanting to adopt it and embrace it and, and go with the change. So we yeah. spend an awful lot of time on you know, culture and change throughout that transformation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think I've closely seen that innovation is the sort of lifeblood at Wery. So like there's that culture of always trying to find the best way to serve customers. And it's really important as well because consumers today, they have so many choices. So you need to build that one-to-one -one relationship with them to keep them engaged. So, but this personalization, it, it can also mean so many different things to different people based on who you are, what your role is. So can you unpack this word for us a little bit? So what does it really mean in practice? Gosh, yeah, sure. So. Um well, I, I think about it from a data perspective, so let's, let's sort of drill down. I, I guess, um, for me, it starts with your broad c customer base and can go right down to an individual. And it's how you, you create a common language for that description. So we have what we call enterprise segmentation, which is our start point. You know, so four million customers, you wanna treat them differently somehow. What's your strategy around that? Is it um, you know, a value segmentation? Is it um, attitudinal? What is it that differentiates them and you think you can differentiate your products, platforms, and services to them? So we start you know, at a top level segments. So top level segments. So we got five. Um, why five? As a data-driven person, the, the data suggested seven. It's too many. It wouldn't get adopted, people couldn't remember it. So we, we started, you know, f five segments. I'll give you a flavor for the type of segments we've got. So um, we've got tech enthusiasts. So, you know, an awful lot of people that come to Berry are very specific about electric. You know, they, um, the gaming computers, their PCs, their, you know, phones, etc. So we've got a whole tech enthusiast segment um, and when we've got deal seekers who, unless you put a promo on, they won't buy. So, you know, two different segments that you want to personalize the experience, the offer, the price, the promotion to, to those. So top level segments, but then with each segment, you'll, you'll have different audiences and, 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 and um, you know, different demographics. And, and for me, the personalization, really, the word is at what stage do you pick how far to go? So are you trying to do an individual one-to-one -one perfect experience in an email as a, for instance, that's just one channel? What's the cost of doing that? You know, how do you understand it? You can't possibly police everything that's going on in that email from a copy and an image and a data perspective. So are you prepared to not understand exactly what's going out? Or have you picked something a bit higher up the funnel so, you know, maybe audiences because demographics or, you know, even regionality differences. So personalization for us is a, a conscious choice of 
whether it's price, promotion, propositional, the app, whatever the experience that we're putting together for a customer, we want to pick the level of personalization and be, make it really conscious with what we're looking to achieve for us and also the customer. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also really important to ensure that whatever level of personalization you're doing, it's working because ultimately customer is at the center of your decisioning, right? So how do you ensure that customers are really happy? Because measuring customer satisfaction can be a challenging thing as well. Yeah, yeah, again, I'll answer it with a data metric. So um, we are very data driven and um, we measure an awful lot of customer KPIs. Um, as a company, everybody's bonus on net promoter score. Mm -hmm. So that, that tunes everybody in to understanding what that is. So what's a net promoter score? How, do, you know, how does the consumer give us the score? What are they scoring is on? How do we unpack the score you know, from a service perspective, from a on-site experience, from a delivery? You know, we're a physical product as well, so it's not just about you know, the e-commerce experience. It's going to be the physical product if it gets delivered and it's, you know, um, there's something wrong with it. So there's this whole end-to-end -end focus on the customer because really we're all bonused on net promoter score and it drives the right behavior and momentum. That's just you know a macro KPI, and then every um, we're very agile with what we do. So every, everything we put in front of the customer through any experience, we try our best to measure it either with an A/B test, ideally. You know, so you currently see that. I'm going to show you something different, and we can measure the uplift and incrementality. Um, if we can't do that, we look for lead and lag indicators of you know whatever the conversion funnel before we put the chains, the conversion funnel after. Um, we, we also um, run an awful lot of focus groups, speaking to customers. Um, so, you know, understanding the feedback on big propositional changes and, and getting that feedback um, in. And actually, I mentioned our segments before. We've actually got uh, families that are segment leads. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, we video them, we interview them, we go into their houses, we understand them. And that gets played back, so everyone, uh, we call it customer closeness. So, you know, understand the customer, understand who they are, and, um, you know, so it's KPIs, but not just data-driven KPIs, it, you know, attitudinal KPIs and net promoter score. Yeah, and I think in my experience with Veri, I've seen that really in practice. Like, measurement is the cornerstone for data-driven data, decision, data -driven decisioning. And uh, it's not just an exercise to review your past performance, but it's actually a forward-looking strategy as well because it enables you to be agile, be competitive, and really build your future strategy rooted in data. Uh, so moving on to the next topic of artificial intelligence. So I think we all agree here today that generative AI is the word of the year. But before we actually move into the generative part of the AI, can you talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence in general is being uh, deployed at Veri? Yeah, yeah, so, um, well, I'll, I'll give you how it's deployed by, I call them our different business verticals. So um, let, let's pick uh, our, our retailing. So again, I'll come back to 250,000 products selling to 4 million people, trying to forecast what stock to buy, of what color, of what you know size, is a difficult challenge. So we've been leveraging you know, machine learning algorithms for a number of years to predict which stock to buy of which individual item on which week, you know, over a which replenishment cycle. So, um, you know, really advanced algorithms in, in that space. So that'll be one for retail, for uh, financial services, because we're also, you know, we offer credit. It will be fraud detection, you know, so what algorithms can we spot fraud early? And we're now even, even um, you know, data-driven, who knew that we've all got a different way of scrolling and typing that started to come through the data. So like a digital fingerprint. So if somebody were to pick up your phone now and try to, you know, get some credit from Very or buy something on Very and you're a, it's a different typing speed and a different way of holding the phone and a different pattern that would get flagged up to, as a potential fraud. So that might be financial services. Um, Customer experience, so we've got um, a chat bot, so um, where the customer can you know, ask many questions from you know, about the products that they wanna buy, but most of the time they're asking about service elements. Where's my, where's my delivery? Where's my package? I was in, 
and you haven't left it, you know, how much do we owe, when are my payments due? So, you know, we use chatbot technology to uh, serve the customer in, 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 in that space. Yep, yep. And specifically on the generative AI side, like there are some clear use cases, you know, that the experts are discussing about in terms of where generative AI can drive more efficiency for employees as well as, you know, elevate experience for customers. What are your thoughts on where can it add the maximum value from an e-commerce business perspective? Um, yeah, we, we frame like Gen AI debate in um, three outcomes. We try to be really outcome focused. Um, the first one is productivity slash cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the next one will be just better decisioning at scale. Um, and the last one is um, new innovative experiences. So if I unpacked each one, um, productivity, well, the example I mentioned before earlier, really, which was, you know, copywriters who need to write, you know, lots and lots of copy and are not getting to it all today. And then we've gone, wouldn't it be great if we could personalize the copy to those five segments I mentioned before? Because we know tech enthusiasts want to understand everything about the length of the cable and the thickness of the cable when they buy that cable, whereas, you know, the dad just buying it for the house just wants the bog standard, how much is it? That different copy is a, an example of where we can create value. Yeah. So that would be a good example of, you know, deploying AI in, um, that's really productivity um, space. Um, when it comes to user experience, probably the big thing, we're using the word conversational. So conversational commerce, conversational retail, so again, for us, um, you know, with, with so many customers and so many products and offering like delivery and service and credit, being able to have a conversation with Very about all of that, chat GPT style, um, we think is a really big opportunity, you know, so to bring search together with chatbot into conversational retail, um, we see as a big opportunity yeah. and then decisioning. So everybody is making some form of decision. How can we let them have, we call that conversational business intelligence. So, you know, today they double click on a dashboard and drill down and look at yesterday's sales or net yesterday's net promoter score or yesterday's conversion funnel or op open rate. Tomorrow, you'll want to be able to have the conversation of how is that different year on year? What do you predict it to be going forward? What do you think I should do to change that with, based upon the levers that I've got? So, you know, conversational decisioning is, is another topic that we're, you know, exploring quite heavily. And what risks or apprehensions do you have in, from when, when it comes to its implementation? Because still, you know, there are many unknowns in that space. So what are you really cautious about? Mm. Um, yeah, t two things that are related. Uh, adoption, I think I mentioned, you know, transformation's all about change. Change is all about people people's culture and adoption. So it, it's, you know, as a data person, it's humans in the loop, but that makes it, you know, sounds not human. What, what it is, is adopting the technology and bringing everyone on the journey. So that definitely keeps us awake because you can have the best machine learning algorithm in the world. If everybody's pointing at it and nobody's using it, yeah. it won't drive any value. So definitely adoption. Um, and the other one is as we're, you know, we're relatively advanced with some of our pilots or tests, it's related, it's explaining, yeah. it's explainability. So the, you know, um, the algorithm suggests discounting the price to X yeah. and the person that runs the P&L for that area, toasters, I run that, I sell all the toasters and it's telling me to discount more than I'm used to, why? unless the, you can explain what the algorithm does to the human, the human won't trust it. Yep. So it's related to your, your, your AI has to have some form of explainability to it. It can't just be because the computer said, you yep. have to say, well, actually, it's looked at the market rate, it's looked at competitor pricing, it's looking to maximize margin, and therefore its recommendation to you is to discount by two pound. Yep. So explainability and, and change. Yeah, and I think, a model will basically give you an answer based on the data it runs on. In terms of your experience, are the businesses 
doing well in terms of their data preparedness on which AI can be deployed or there is some more work that needs to be done on the underlying layer as well? Yeah, yeah, the, the boring plumbing and piping and data quality is definitely part of uh, the challenge slash roadmap. Um, and again, it's educating the people that maybe enter the data into the system. So we got a good one on promotional effectiveness, you know, so most e-commerce websites will do some form of promotion, you know, 20% off, 70% off, whatever. Um, and the people that were entering the information didn't put the start date and the end date. How can you measure promotional effectiveness if you don't know when it's live? Yeah. And to them though, they don't care because it's up there, they've got their discount, they're trading away. But to the measurement team, you're like, we don't even know the date it was live. How can we give you a measurement report? And they're like, well, we're too busy to enter the date. So then, you know, you have to make it a mandatory process and educate them on the measurement framework that comes out the other end. So you've got to link it again, link, link it to the benefit to them and link it to the, out, you know, the outcome. Yeah. Now, before I go to the audience for some questions, a last one from my side. So what are you really excited about the future for e-commerce? Where do you think e-commerce industry is heading in general? Oh gosh, big, big broad question, but I, I guess I'm just going to use this word conversational because I just like it as a narrative. Uh, I think it, you know, the interaction with brands today has been, uh, especially a catalog business, you think of what's changed through the catalog. The catalog moved from a print to in-store where you go in and you know, buy a screen to a catalog on you know, the website, which is still you know, drilling through, drilling back up and a search. I just think the whole immersive experience mm -hmm. Um, you know, I image recognition, taking a photo of the sofa and putting it in your front room. Uh, I think, you know, immersive conversational e-commerce, it's, you know, if you're not looking at it, your competitors will be, and someone's going to crack it. And, you know, because it's all about the consumer and pretty yeah. sure the consumer will start to adopt that type of um, proposition. Yeah, yeah, cool. So anyone in the audience would like to ask a question? Yes, please. Um, really nice to, to meet you and also such a great and informative talk. I, I think I can speak for everyone that AI is such a buzzword at the moment. Um, I was wondering how you were using AI in your payments related data. So I guess the last stage of the conversion process, like where you create friction, where you don't to make sure that I guess the most number of legitimate payments go through. Oh, I struggle a bit with the volume. So did you say, you might have to shout a bit, did you say AI in payments data and how you're using AI there to make sure the most legitimate payments go through and you don't get things like false declines. Yeah, so again, a big, big focus in our financial services division um, with the consumer in mind, obviously transparency, consumer um, uh, um, focus. We, we, back to that explainability we don't overuse ai in a lot of our financial services payments cases because you can't you have to be able to explain what it does and how it works so we definitely use it it's probably simpler more regressional analysis more trend patterns more anomaly detection style than you know full end-to-end -end you know ad adapted ml if that makes sense anyone else yes please Hi. Um, yeah, I agree. It was a can't hear you. Sorry. Hear. No. Okay. Here now. Yeah. Yes. Go for it. Um, really interested to see that you're using data so widely across the group. Um, and you said something about NPS and unpacking um, the detail behind it. Could you expand a bit more about how you use that? Do you use that for purchase prediction, for example? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So. Um, well, the, the first thing we've got descriptive analytics around it, so people you know can drill down year on year. We we've done correlation analysis between business drivers and what we think the outcome is to be able to segment like the drivers. So delivery is massive, returns is massive, price is massive, service is massive. So we we try to do like trend analysis and like an impact regression analysis on the the um, the propositions that we can change that do have a positive or negative impact on net promoter score and the, the weighting of them. So, and then we also um, do a lot with um, the verbatims, you know, so um, classification of positive and negative feedback, 
and the ability to interrogate that and ask it some questions like um, hopefully that answers so I think to conclude can I ask you to give us three takeaways for today so if I have to leave this uh, room now what are the three things that we should take with us um, well I think the first one is transformation and change and culture don't forget about the people like as, as technologists we you know love the new shiny thing um, you've got to think about how you're going to adopt it use it leverage it so that's the first thing um, embrace and be agile so you know we do a lot of agile fail fast we did something the other week with images we thought oh we're going to be able to generate all these images within four weeks we realized it just wasn't ready for that closed it down moved on to the next use case so I think you know agile test and learn fail fast and then once you've got something guess it's execution at that point so and be really clear on the outcome um, again as as a technologist and a data person it's quite easy to point at the things that you're doing rather than the outcome you want so try and tie it back to your business and customer outcome yeah. always a pleasure Steve thank you Thanks, and thank Andy. you all for your time today thank you thank you thanks all thank you.